Too often we think we've got it figured out. Too often we get caught up in our own discoveries, and that's really what they are, is discoveries. Discoveries of how God has made things and how we can use those things God's provided. And we get so caught up in our own discoveries that we think we're really special. And we think we're really smart, and other people just aren't as sharp as we are. And I have to tell you that one of the things that, that is going around among the, the, the pastoral circles right now, and I'm glad to see this going around, is an understanding that too many pastors get up and they preach and they talk about what they know, and then five minutes later, or even in the service, they try to talk about things they really don't know and don't understand. And they try to say things about the things that, that aren't in their area of study. They start making statements about math and science and English and history that they, that they don't know. And when they do so, it's irritating to other people and it tears down what they do know. I think we all do that, don't we? Sometimes we, we get so full of ourselves that we just want to tell somebody what we know and we think we know the most about everything, especially because we've been on Yahoo recently and we read a story about it, right? Or we were on Google and we looked it up and we think we know, and, and then we end up saying something that really isn't all that smart because it wasn't an area where we had done a lot of study. Kind of an irritating moment, isn't it? Have you ever been with somebody like that? They start spouting off about something they don't know, and you're standing going, right, what do I say now, right? How do I be nice? And then there's a next step to this. And the next step is, if I'm wise, and I understand the way the world works, why do I need religion anyway? Why do I need God? I get it. I understand it. I know how things work. And if I forget, I can always go on Wikipedia and find it. Somebody can tell me how it works. So why do I need God? Why do I need Jesus in my life? And St. Paul was dealing with people who were asking similar questions. People of Corinth weren't that different than we are today. They were part of a large city that saw lots of people come through, lots of people from different cultures and from different lands who were selling all kinds of goods and who were, who were moving things, and they had lots of contact. And they thought they were really smart people for their area and for their time of the world. And so they didn't see much need for God. They didn't see wisdom in a Savior who had died humiliating death. And so they asked those questions, just like we do. We ask questions about, why does God's Son have to die? And how did that work? Those are questions that are questions of faith. We can't prove them with empirical data. We can't stand them and say, gee, I saw every sin hung on Jesus, and I watched them wash away. It comes through faith an understanding of who Jesus was and what his purpose was for us. And then other questions start to pop up. Neat questions like, what was there before God? Things that we, as finite human beings, can't answer. And so often we look to the Bible and we say, gosh, I wonder if, if God is real. Because I don't have this answer. And if I'm smart enough to think this question up, maybe God should have left me an answer. And you see how quickly Satan takes us down a path that leads us to see that we understand everything. And God, God may not even be there. And then there's things that, that we just ask ourselves that are, that are kind of silly. They're kind of silly about, about God and about things that go on. And as soon as we step that line over, then we start saying, you know what? Maybe the whole church is just a bunch of silly rituals. We start pointing our finger at things, and the, and the world does this and says, you know, all churches is a bunch of people getting together and doing things that don't really matter and pretending that there's something out there. See how the steps evolve? It's really kind of a simple process. Simple process that goes from not acknowledging that there's anything special about what God's created to then not thinking that God could be as smart as we are, to then not thinking that God exists at all. And the people who follow Jesus are just some silly people who aren't that smart at all. It's interesting. It's interesting how it all works. But then we get back to that orange, or that man, or that clementine. We ask that question, how would you do it? And we recognize that we can't. We can't make it. We can't start with nothing, or next to nothing, or even, even tiny things, and make it happen. The smallest we can get to is we can get to a seed and we can say, I put the seed in the ground and I watched it grow up and then I picked the, the, the fruit. That's as good as we can get. 
Nobody can sit in a laboratory and say, okay, I'm going to take these materials here and these here and these here, I'm going to put this thing together and I'm going to come up with this. It doesn't happen, right? So what do we really do in our lives? If we aren't creating, what is it that we're really doing? What we're really doing is we change things. Now, we can genetically engineer that this will be resistant to all kinds of, of bugs and all kinds of things that might make it harmful. We can change the size, we can change the color sometimes, we can do all kinds of things by messing with the seeds and, and, and playing with them. We even sometimes they, they do things like radiate the seeds and see what happens, and, you know, they get all kinds of weird stuff. But that's just messing with what God already provided for us. We can change how we use it. We go and meet recipes that say this makes it taste better and this makes this thing taste better. And that's kind of cool and fun. We can even experiment with stuff. But we can't make it. We can't create it. We don't have that capability. We cannot create. And so the problem we have is that when we, when we look at God, we recognize there's something there in the Creator that's more than we will ever have up here in our minds. And we begin to realize that this passage that we read has some meaning for us. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom. And God's weakness is stronger than human strength. I don't know about you, but sometimes I go into a market or some other place, I look at some things and I go, wow, I wonder why God made this. You know? There's an old movie out called Oh God that George Burns was in. Very funny movie. And, and as God comes down, he explains to John Denver that, uh, you know, God made a few mistakes. And he says, the avocado for one. <laughs> if you look at the avocado, it's mostly the pit. And, 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 and then you've got to tear off the shell. And when you get that, finally, time, you don't get much of it. And he says, the giraffe was another one, way too tall of a neck. You know, we can look at things and we can wonder, why did God make these things the way God made them? But at the end of the day, it was God who made them work. It was God who gave us these things that we sometimes as human beings think are foolish, but God made them work. And if you look at them deeply enough, what you find out is they're pretty incredible things. They're pretty incredible creations to be able to function the way that they do, and to be able to survive and be able to live. And so then we look back at our own lives. And we look at our own lives and we say, wow, God is incredible. God understood that we would reject everything that was good. God understood that we would make mistakes and we would feel guilt and we would feel shame. God understood that when that happens, we wouldn't be nicer people, we would be less nice people. God understood that as we got wrapped up in the struggles of who we are and the mistakes we've made, that if there wasn't something that came away, came along and washed that sin away, we would be forever lost and unable to reconnect with the wisdom of God create such things. So he sent Jesus. He sent Jesus to die a humiliating death on the cross. And he sent him with a message for us. And that message was that in this cross, in this implement of death, when you recognize this in your life, what you're saying is, I understand that I make mistakes. I understand that I'm not really wise. I understand that God has given me in faith salvation and a connection to the Creator that I couldn't have had on my own. And in an amazing way, we humbly come before that cross and receive God's grace and mercy and wisdom. So as you go out this week, what I would say to you is, is this. It's about being humble. It's about being humble as we share that message of salvation with others. Because humility is knowing that in Jesus Christ, we share what seems to be foolish, but really is wise. We share the power of salvation, and love, and peace, and joy that comes from Jesus. But the world has a hard time seeing what really is the greatest gift any of us could ever receive. Amen. Will you pray with me? Lord God, our Heavenly Father, there are people who want to make us feel foolish. There are people who say things to make themselves seem wise and to put us down. We pray, O oh Lord, that even in the midst of those moments, you would give us the humility to understand that you have given us the forgiveness of our sins. We pray that you would give us the humility to share that message again, knowing that your wisdom
truly is so much greater than we can imagine, and that even your foolishness is greater than our wisdom. We thank you for this in the form of Jesus, who died a humble and foolish death for our foolish sins, so that we might be given the greatest gift of all, the presence of your Son, the presence in heaven, the presence of being in eternal wisdom. Christ confess our faith in the words of the Apostles Peter is printed for you in your bulletins and in your bulletins. I believe in God, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, and born of the Virgin Mary, who suffered in the conscious pride, who was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell.